there I was, driving down the freeway, and all of a sudden the place went crazy. Cars going in all directions, and not one of them had a driver. I mean, it was wild. I think we've got an invasion from outer space. What do we have here? A dream? A nightmare? Or maybe even a religious fiction thriller? It is written. This is George Vanderman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, a living Christ. Today from the showdown at Armageddon series, Secret of the Rapture. This vivid description that opened our telecast today came from the late great planet Earth. Hal Lindsey's book about the rapture and Earth's final crisis. The rapture, explains Lindsay, is the sudden, silent, and invisible coming of Jesus to snatch the saints away from this world. Then follows seven years inside heaven's pearly gates, after which Jesus will return here to overcome the Antichrist at the showdown of the Battle of Armageddon. Quite an intriguing scenario. No wonder Christians everywhere have become excited about it. You've seen the bumper stickers. Warning, driver will be raptured at any moment. Or, if I'm raptured, take the wheel. It'll happen very soon, rapturous believe. They point to the establishment of Israel as a nation back in 1948 and recall what Jesus said. This generation will by no means pass away till all these things are fulfilled. Rapturists have figured that a generation equals 40 years or so. Therefore, the end should come around 1988. But wait, the rapture, the secret rapture, is already long overdue. It should have happened around 1981, launching seven years of tribulation on earth. After that, Christ was supposed to come back here again to this earth with his saints in 1988. Now, that's what many rapturists were teaching in the 1970s. Well, you can imagine how millions of them felt when Christ failed to take them up to heaven in 1981. The Chicago Sun-Times reported how 50 members of the Lighthouse Gospel Foundation of Tucson quit their jobs disposed of property in anticipation of the rapture on June 28, 1981. One of their members, a young physician, testified, I've never known such peace, such joy. Even now, Christ has not yet returned for his people, so the raptures had to be rescheduled. But it still will come at any time, we are told. Any moment, Jesus could come and sneak his people away. Friend, many Christians believe this with all their hearts. And many other Christians, equally sincere, feel that rapturists are seriously mistaken. How can we know the truth? Hadn't we better go back to our Bibles again and find out? First, we discover the word rapture itself is not in the English Bible. It comes from a Latin word meaning to snatch away to be carried away when the Lord returns. The word translated rapture shows up in the Latin version of 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. Listen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together that's where the word rapture is found, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall ever be with the Lord. Imagine how wonderful it will be to hear Jesus shout for joy as he descends from heaven to take us home and to listen to the mighty blast from the trumpet of God. Christ's coming for his people will be the most vocal, the most spectacular event of all time. Well, with all this shouting and trumpeting, you wonder how secret the rapture will really be. 
Maybe it won't be something secret at all. Evidently not. And come to think of it, why would Jesus have to sneak us up to heaven? How much more appropriate for our coming King to burst triumphantly through the clouds and call us home? In fact, that's what the Bible teaches. Many rapturists are surprised to discover that the Bible never says Christ will come in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52 says, We shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, the change of our bodies from mortal to internal, immortal, will happen instantly. But Christ's coming itself will be loud and long enough for trumpets to sound. Notice the words of Jesus himself in that marvelous second coming chapter of Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect. Everyone on earth, saved or lost, will know it when Jesus returns to gather his elect saints. Now the Bible does say that Christ will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. But does that mean the world will not realize when it is happening? Of course, you remember Pearl Harbor, on that fateful morning of December 7, 1941. Even though American intelligence had warned of an imminent Japanese attack, they caught us unawares. But when those bombers dove out of the sky, everyone could hear what was happening. So it'll be at the return of Jesus, despite worldwide warnings. The unsaved will be caught by surprise, but they'll certainly be aware of Christ's presence. Now, what will happen to those who are not ready to meet Jesus? Will they have further opportunity to repent? That's what secret rapturists teach. But that brings us to a very disturbing question. What if this second chance idea is false? What if human probation ends at the coming of Christ? Let's see what the Bible tells us. Luke 17, this time, verses 26 and 27. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. You know how it was in the days of Noah, business as usual until that fatal surprise came from the sky. All who had neglected God's warning lost their lives. Luke 17, verse 30, even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. After Christ's coming, dead bodies will be scattered across the earth. Yes, Jesus said some would be taken and some would be left, but those left behind are dead. Luke 17 describes it, verses 34 to 37. Two people will be in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. Where, Lord? they asked. He replied, where there is a dead body, there the vultures will gather. So everyone ready to meet Jesus, he will take up to heaven. Any unprepared will remain here dead and tragically left on the ground for vultures to consume. No second chance. Are we beginning to see the danger in this secret rapture teaching, however sincere people may have been in their belief? If our unsaved friends and relatives don't make their decision before Christ comes, they can never be saved. As God's Word puts it, behold, now is the day of salvation. We've repeated it again and again. So you see, the secret rapture simply isn't scriptural. It's a medieval myth, a carryover from the 16th century counter-reformation, which we studied in our last telecast. Protestant scholars during Reformation times all believed that Christ's coming for his people would be anything but secret. In fact, an Old Testament prophecy in the book of Daniel convinced them of it. We'll take a look at that prophecy in just a moment, but first I want to make sure you request your copy of our new book, Showdown at Armageddon.
It contains today's message, plus any in this telecast series that you may have missed so far, plus much more on Bible prophecy than we have time to talk about in our brief telecast. Some of the chapter titles are Jerusalem Invaded, Thunderball from Israel, Counterfeiting Armageddon. I think you'll appreciate every chapter in the book. It's our gift for you. We'll explain how you can get yours in just a few minutes. Now back to our study of Daniel. Let's go to chapter 2. We find here a dream that God gave to an ancient monarch. Watch the fascinating drama as it unfolds. The king, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. The time, 600 years before Christ. The hero of the hour, Daniel again, that teenage captive from the land of Judah, now promoted to the royal court. Now, God wanted to get the attention of the proud ruler, so he gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream one night, only to cause him to forget its message when morning dawned. The king remembered only that whatever he had dreamed was quite spectacular, very significant. Well, desperately, Nebuchadnezzar demanded that his psychic counselors tell him the dream which he forgot and its interpretation. You see, they were supposed to know. But when they didn't, he condemned them all to die. And because the king didn't understand the difference between a psychic and a prophet, Daniel was rounded up with the others to be executed. His life was at stake. So Daniel asked for an audience with the king. He requested time to pray to his God, promising to return with both the dream and its interpretation, its meaning. The king agreed. And did Daniel, did God fail Daniel? Not in the least. In a night vision, he revealed to his young prophet what the king had dreamed and what it meant. Well, the next morning, Daniel quickly headed for the palace where the king was eagerly waiting. Could this unpretentious young captive possibly do what his trusted counselors could not do? Well, we pick up the story in verse 31 of Daniel 2. Listen with the king as Daniel recounts what he has dreamed. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. Intently, the king eyes the noble face of God's youthful messenger as he continues in verse 32 and verse 33. This image's head was of fine gold its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet part of iron and partly of clay. Well, absolutely spellbound, Nebuchadnezzar, proud monarch of the mighty Babylonian Empire, stares at Daniel in amazement. This humble servant of heaven's God is reporting with uncanny accuracy the dream which had escaped his memory. Daniel goes on. Verses 34 and 35. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. The king relived the startling scene. He saw the majestic image with its head of glittering gold, its breast of polished silver. He saw again the body and thighs of burnished bronze, the legs of solid iron, and strangest of all, the mixture of iron and clay from which the feet were formed. But why was the gold replaced by the silver? and the silver by the bronze. What was the meaning of the huge stone which knocked the statue down? Would Daniel tell him? So leaning to the edge of his throne, the monarch waited breathlessly now as Daniel prepared to interpret. And now the moment we've been waiting for, verses 37 and 38. You, O king, are this head of gold. How flattering Nebuchadnezzar must have imagined. How flattering flattering and fitting that his kingdom should be represented by the head of gold. After all, were not historians already calling Babylon the golden kingdom? 
But then followed some bad news for Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar raised his royal eyebrows as Daniel disclosed in verse 39. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. What? His kingdom to come to an end? Babylon to be succeeded? And by an inferior power at that? Yes, Babylon would not last forever. It was only the first of a series of kingdoms which would succeed upon the ruins of one another. Cyrus the Persian, Persian would conquer Babylon even in Daniel's day. It happened during the Feast of Belshazzar. Remember the handwriting on the wall? The double monarchy of the Medes and the Persians represented by the two silver arms of the statue ruled for two centuries. Today it lies in ruins. For prophecy had decreed in verse 39, another, a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. This is the bronze kingdom of Greece, led by Alexander the Great. This ambitious leader climaxed his lightning conquest in the Battle of Arbela, 331 years before Christ. At the incredibly youthful age of 25, he reigned as master of all he surveyed. But seven years later, he was dead. So swiftly does earthly glory fade. Now came the fourth kingdom of iron, which was Rome, the iron monarchy of history. In the days of that empire, Jesus lived and died. Roman soldiers officiated at the crucifixion, and a Roman seal, you remember, closed his tomb. One, two, three, four, four world empires. And would you not expect that if there were four, there might also be a fifth arising upon the ruins of the fourth? But no, the divine forecast states in verse 41, Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Something new here. A change would take place, a division. And did it happen? Yes, during the fourth and fifth centuries, several distinct nations emerged within the boundaries of Western Rome. The mighty empire, the Caesars, disintegrated before the onslaughts of barbarians. And in her place, we see the well-known nations today, Germany, France, Switzerland, Portugal, England, Spain, Italy. I ask you, could human wisdom predict the future with such accuracy? No. Fulfilled Bible prophecy stamps the word of God as divine. But now we come to verse 43. This is what we've been waiting for. And as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. What do you think of that? Seven words that doom world conquest. They will not adhere to one another. Europe would never stick together under one government, according to the sure word of prophecy. We notice an interesting pattern in world history. Nebuchadnezzar had no difficulty ruling the world, nor did Cyrus or Alexander or the Caesars. But then everything changed. Since the days of the Roman Empire, history has been like a broken record. It tells the story of every would-be dictator in one persistent word, defeat, defeat, defeat. That one word tells the story of Charlemagne, Louis XIV, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, Hitler, and every dreaming dictator who yet may follow, and back of it all is a power-packed prophecy. Napoleon had seemed the superman of destiny. In 1799, he seized France, set out to unite the remaining segments of the empire in Europe. But you remember how God used the Duke of Wellington to dramatically fulfill Daniel II at Waterloo? when Napoleon's idea of world empire collapsed. A century passed. Then Kaiser Wilhelm set out with the same idea in 1914. And we all know the end of that story. And even while news of fresh disaster poured in from every front, a corporal in action on the crumbling German lines entered a hospital. Nothing seemed to be wrong with him, but he appeared so completely devastated that the hospital assigned him a cot. Then this defiant soldier turned his face to the wall and refused to acknowledge the defeat of Germany. Two days later, 
Adolf Hitler rose from that bed and left the hospital with a feverish desire to marshal the world under his banner. And that story, too, has been written in ashes with the blood and the tears of millions. Hitler was doomed to failure through the word of God in Daniel, the second chapter. He who knows the end from the beginning says that the broken pieces of the Roman Empire will never cleave together. Military leaders and peace agencies alike have tried, but have met failure through those simple words. They will not adhere to one another. Any attempt to unite Europe cannot last. And now the climax to it all, the destiny of the nations, your destiny and mine, is found in the words of Daniel 2.44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Not in the days of Babylon, or Persia, or Grecia, or Rome, but down here in these days, the days of these kings, in our time, God will set up his kingdom. And notice that Christ's coming kingdom will shatter all other kingdoms on this planet. Life will end on earth with no second chance for repentance. And it won't be a secret rapture, you see. This grand climax of the ages will be seen and heard by all. Wonderful news indeed. This is not sensationalism, not a wild or fanciful speculation about prophecy. Daniel, the second chapter, brings us a certain message from God's word that the next great event of history will be the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in power and glory. Oh, friend, have you placed yourself on God's side? Now is the time to do so. Now is the day of salvation. The King is coming. And if his coming does not fit into your plans, then by all means, change your plans. God will help you. Listen as Marilyn Cotton sings the sounds of his coming. I can hear the sounds of his coming everywhere. In the headlines resounding by the shore It may be another earthquake Or just another war But to every child of God It's something more And when I hear the sound of marching Hear the sound Thank you, Marilyn. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, again we thank you for this invitation. The deeper we probe, the clearer the future becomes, and the more certain our salvation depends on a relationship with your dear Son. 
thank God for Jesus and his invitation to accept him and the certainty of his welcome return. Prepare us for that day, dear God, in his saving name we ask. Amen. Yes, friend, Jesus is coming soon. And it won't be secret. Every eye will see him come. I hope you'll be one of those who are looking forward to his coming, fully prepared and eagerly waiting for that glad day. And I believe the book we're offering today can help in that preparation. Along with your Bible, this book, Showed Down at Armageddon, contains the vital truths we all need to know in these last days. Won't you take the time just now to write us or call the number that will appear on your screen? We've set aside a copy just for you, but we do need to hear from you. Ask for it by name, show down at Armageddon, and we'll put it in the mail immediately. Here then is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Thank you for your letters and prayer requests. Be sure to mention the offer by name when you write George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. And now next week, Planet Earth's New Age. Be with us then, but the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Next week, Pastor Vandeman explores another much debated subject, the millennium. When will it take place and where? Join us here on It Is Written for Planet Earth's New Age, next week here at this same time.